Hello. Glory to Jesus Christ. So today is Tuesday, the 18th of August in the memorable year 2020 and we're at our Bible study today here at Holy Family on 2nd Peter and last time I had mentioned that I didn't get enough time to look at some of the commentaries from the Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture, Volume 9 in the New Testament, on 2 Peter. And all things that pertain to godliness. Peace and grace are the means by which God gives us everything we need in order to live a godly life. That's a theophilac. And in participating in the divine nature, which is so important to the, uh, the Byzantine Christian theology of theosis, of being engodded, of being transformed by partaking of the very nature of God, which is love, and God sharing his divine power, his dunamis, and his energies with us, his uh, working energy with that, which uh, is a true partaking of the divine, divine reality. So we cannot know God in his divine essence, but we can fully experience him in the energies, the divine energies. So, uh, so in origin, who's not a church father, but who is very influential, what is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? Peter describes this by calling it sharing in divine nature in his commentary on Leviticus. Escape from corruption. The word of Christ bestows immortality, but immortality is the companion of divinity, because divinity is immortal, and so immortality is the result of partaking in the divine nature. This is the commentary on uh, 2 Peter 1, 4, partaking of the divine nature. The fusis. We become Christ-bearers, Cyril of Jerusalem, when Christ's body and blood become the tissue of our members. So uh, in, in Eastern theology, uh, sacramentology, the partaking of the Eucharist, the very body and blood of Christ, it, there's, we, when Christ's body and blood become the tissue of our members, we become Christ-bearers, and partakers of the divine nature, that states Cyril of Jerusalem in his catechetical lectures, 4.3. The measure of God's nature, Hilary of Poitiers. Since the Christian is conscious of having been made a partaker of the divine nature, as Blessed Peter says in his second epistle, he must measure the nature of God not by the laws of our own nature, but evaluate the divine truths in accordance with the magnificence of God's testimony concerning himself. In St. Ambrose of Milan, Milan, the fact is that God made humankind a partaker of the divine nature, as we read in the second epistle of Peter. He granted us a relationship with himself, and we have a rational nature which makes us able to seek what is divine, which is not far from each one of us, in whom we live and move and have our being. Letter, his letter to priests, 49. And this is on page 132 in 
that ninth volume of the Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture. Realize your dignity, Leo the Great. Realize your dignity, O Christian. Once you have been made a partaker of the divine nature, do not return to your former baseness of a, by a life unworthy of that dignity. Remember whose head it is and whose body of which you constitute a member. Sermon 21.3 Step out of your former nature, Hilary of Arles. Just as God stepped out of his nature to become a partaker of our humanity, which isn't exactly actually the case. He certainly, you know, Jesus remained the word of God in every sense, uh, uh, but he did empty himself of his glory in partaking of our, our humanity. He stepped out of, quote unquote, his divine comfort zone in becoming human. So we are called to step out of our nature to become partakers of his divinity, which actually is the purification, healing, and fulfillment of our nature, this partaking of the divine nature. Becoming partakers, be the venerable. The greater your knowledge of God becomes, the more you will realize the magnitude of his promises. When God blesses us, he changes our very being, so that what we were by nature is transformed by the gift of his Holy Spirit, so that we may truly become partakers of his nature. His commentary on this epistle, 2 Peter. Grace enables participation. Andreas, God has blessed us abundantly. That is the meaning of this passage. We have received thousands of good things as a result of Christ's coming. And through them, we can become partakers of the divine nature and be turned towards life and godliness. Therefore, we must behave in such a way as to add virtue to faith and in virtue walk along the way which leads to godliness until we come to the perfection of all good things, which is love. And that's the katena, the chain. And then verse 5, where he gives the, the link up of all these uh, virtues and attitudes. Supplement faith with virtue, feed. When Peter talks about virtue here, he does not mean the power to perform miracles, but the strength to lead a good life which means putting our faith into practice, otherwise it's dead faith. If we fail to do this, our faith is dead, and we become aiders and abettors of those who want to destroy any good works we may have done on Second Peter. Steps to complete responsiveness to grace. Because this divine nature is grace, gift, gift of God the energies of God, grace, transforming, not just coating over, but infused and, and transforming. Theophylact. Peter lays out here the order which we are to follow to come into full maturity. First of all comes faith, which is the foundation and source of all good works. Next comes virtue, by which he means good works, for without them, faith is dead, as St. James said. Next comes knowledge. What is that? It is an understanding of the secret things hidden in God, which are not revealed to everyone, but only to those who continue faithfully in the works already mentioned. Commentary on Second Peter. And then the next verse, verse 6, which is still the listing, listing here of virtues, the chain of virtues. Supplement knowledge with self-control. Gregory the Great, those who fast must be very careful to make sure that in running away from the desires of the stomach, they do not give birth to vices which are much worse, almost as if their virtue were producing them. For it is easy to mortify the flesh, but at the same time to become very impatient in spirit. And this impatience upsets the minds of many who abstain from the desires of the world. Commentary on Second Peter. So the 
if one uh, resists gluttony and lust and things like that, the physical things, and exercises uh, asceticism and fasting and in uh, abstinence from this or that, one of the problems is that that can give birth rather than to virtue, uh, to pride. So humility has to always com accompany every every act of devotion, especially acts of asceticism. Uh, but it, that has to accompany every good work. Indeed, it has to accompany every work of faith, because faith, which is primarily a gift, a grace of God, is also a work we have to cooperate with. We have to develop that uh, in cooperation with grace. Yeah, so, And then works that come out of faith, because faith... The profession of faith is a work that you're doing that. You know, if it's a work of the will, a work of the mind. But and then when you profess it, it's a work of the mouth. But the, those two won't be, don't become the virtue of faith. It's only when we act on it, when we live it, then that's the, that's the virtue of faith, which the will is very important in that the sanctified will, the healed will. Because our will cannot be fully free except by grace. Yes, we're responsible. We have a quote-unquote a free will. Of that. We're not predetermined. We're not puppets at, at the fingers of God the puppeteer. Uh, but we're, we're free agents. But we're damaged. Damaged in the will, damaged in the intellect damaged in the emotions, damaged on every level. It's like this, uh, an analogy to this corona uh, virus, this, uh, the uh, COVID-19 here, uh, that cause it can get to e into everything. Get into the heart, get into the brain, get into the lungs, get into all sorts of organs, get into the nervous system. It can uh, in, wreck, wreak havoc. And so it is with uh, dead faith that can uh, wreak havoc. Or, or this, uh, or, or pride, should we say, pride as the vice. It can get into everything and uh, destroy all the virtue. So it's, it's a sense, and humility is the only cure. Authentic humility. Self-control with steadfastness be the venerable. As people learn to do good, they will stop, soon stop doing evil. If anyone does not do so, his knowledge of heavenly things disappears as if in a vacuum. So it's all a head, head uh, belief. It's all head uh, stuff and no, not in reality. It's not living. It's a, a living spiritual knowledge impels us to virtue, impels us to good works, impels us to active faith. Self-control requires steadfastness. So self-control is very important. It's one of the, the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, sometimes when they list it, they translate that as, as chastity, which it is. That's an aspect of self-control. But the self-control goes through all, all the levels, dealing with all the capital sins, with greed, with, with uh, lust, with uh, gluttony, with anger, with all of this. We just need self-control in this. And it's the grace that's the control. And as St. James talked about controlling the tongue, how crucial that is. Self-control requires steadfastness. Because whenever, whoever has learned to stay away from the pleasures of the world needs the willpower to go on doing so. The person who reaches the point of self-discipline may truly be called godly. Again, uh, that's it's commentary on Second Peter. Temperance and patience, the awful act. Next in the list comes abstinence or temperance. Temperance actually is... More than it's it's moderation is what what that is. It's not just uh, 
It's not abstinence, total abstinence. It's a, that's like, like some of the uh, uh, total abstinence groups called them uh, temperance societies. But a uh, temperance society would be someone who is uh, very careful in drinking alcohol, but drinks alcohol. That the, uh, that the abstinence would be to give it up altogether, which some people, people who are addicted to it or people who are uh, psychologically prone to drunkenness uh, need to do. Next on the list comes abstinence or temperance. This is necessary in order to ensure that those who get this far are not carried away by the magnitude of the gift they have received and become haughty as a result. So this is modesty here, uh, the temperance is modesty. Patience follows next, because it takes time to acquire temperance. And without patience, a person is liable to give up and fall into something even worse than that from which he has been delivered. Patience increases our trust in God, which is why godliness comes next. Supplement godliness with brotherly love. This is verse 7. The only context in which godliness has any meaning is that of brotherly love. You cannot win people to Christ merely by arguing them into the kingdom. It is necessary to practice godliness by prayer and good works. Charity here means the love of God, because we cannot love God without loving our neighbor. Nor can we love our neighbor without loving God. The love of God is greater than the love of our neighbor, which is why we have to practice it with all our heart, mind, and strength on the second Peter. It's also a sort of comment on Jesus' comment on uh, the, uh, the, uh, the law on which the law and the prophets rely, to love God with your whole heart, Soul, mind, and strength in your neighbor as yourself. And this little passage, this little commentary read, is worth uh, putting up uh, on your wall. It's, it's really good. Supplement brotherly love, brotherly affection. So this is the Philadelphia that we were talking about before, uh, uh, last week. Supplement brotherly affection with love. Theophilact. The more we love God, the more we are like God, the more we are compelled by that likeness to love others, which is why brotherly love is next in the list. Finally, there is charity, the agape, which is the perfection of all virtues, as Paul also confirms in 1 Corinthians 13. And so the agape is not only the crowning of all the virtues, it's the motivation of all the virtues. It's the foundation of all the virtues. It's the life of all the virtues. So let's get to where we left off. And we didn't say our prayer for the Holy Spirit, name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant that, by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I have an interesting book here, which is a, a, a Bible parallel. So it has it has four different translations in it. I have another one that has another four different translations, and they're all uh, side by side, so you can compare. Uh, this one is good because it's a complete. That is, it has the uh, whole Bible in it. It has the, uh, the Deuterocanonical books in the Old Testament, as well as the, uh, those accepted by the Pharisee canon. 
and the uh, the Essing canon was before. And the four versions in this particular one, which was published by The paper is very thin, it's hard to show the pages. The tissue paper stuff. So that, that's, I, uh, I have a Bible that I use to write my notes in, a, a Jerusalem Bible, because it has regular paper. It doesn't have this tissue paper stuff here. So the four versions of the, re in this one, the New Revised Standard Version, the Revised English Version, the New American Bible, and the New Jerusalem, and it's from Oxford University Press. And it was published in 1985. Again, the print is so small on this. And printed in the United States of America. There we are. But this is it's worth getting a a parallel Bible. You can you can look at the the different translations and see how they they differ, and and so many things. And here we are in in Second Peter. Get the. I think we'll let the apostolic witness here. Yeah. Verse, we can start back up and start at verse 8. If these are yours, all the, the these virtues, this chain of virtues, crowned by love, agape love, if these are yours and increase in abundance, this is chapter 1, verse 8. If these are yours and increase in abundance, they will keep you from being idle or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone who lacks them is blind and short-sighted, forgetful of the cleansing of his past sins. So, you know, so we've confessed our sin and we've gone against it, but then we just uh, turn on the faith. We go back to mortal sin uh, and we... Uh, let the virtues atrophy, and, and or we break the chain of the virtues. We, we just have one virtue. If you have one virtue, that it becomes a vice. An example I often use is zeal, the virtue of zeal. But it's only the virtue of zeal if it's motivated by charity and by uh, temperance and prudence and uh, truth-seeking and... Uh, Compassion, uh, all of these other th other other virtues. Otherwise, it becomes fanaticism. It is 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 destructive. It's a vice, because you can have zeal for wickedness, but it it doesn't make it a virtue. The same is true of uh, knowledge. So you have uh, knowledge. You're cultivating a. You're seeking knowledge. And that's good. You you're reading. You're uh, and I'm talking about spiritual knowledge here. You're, you're reading about prayer. You're reading about the doctrines of the church. You're reading the catechism. You're reading the holy scriptures. You're reading all these commentaries. You're listening to tapes. You're listening to CDs. You're listening to DVDs. You're all this stuff. You're watching EWTN. You're doing all this stuff. Well, that's good. But if you if it's not uh, supplemented with uh, the other virtues, in particular love, agape love, then it's it's going to be useless. It, it will be a weapon used against people rather than used to help people. It will be uh, used to uh, cultivate arrogance and pride in its worst sense. And also, ironically, to cultivate ignorance. Because you're not going to go after uh, knowledge that's going to threaten you that's going to uh, challenge your egotism, so that. So you, 
you have to have all these these things together. Otherwise, you're blind and cleansed and short-sighted. Therefore, brothers, be all the more eager to make your call an election permanent, as I mentioned last week. Permanent there. Firm. So uh, this is uh, hard to square with once saved, always saved theologies, which Catholicism rejects. Uh, that <coughs> uh, we, are, we have to persevere. Perseverance is so crucial a virtue, which Jesus talks about all the time, and uh, and to be alert. If, if, if you have it made, why be alert? It doesn't make sense. But, uh, uh, and if, you know, no uh, uh, mortal sins can't uh, uh, take over again, if you, uh, if you believe that, that it's impossible for you to have an actual mortal sin, even if you do gravely uh, wicked things, gravely sinful things, with full consent to the will and real knowledge that they're really gravely e uh, evil, that it's profoundly distorted, disordered, and uh, contrary to the will of God. Uh, and you know that, and you know it, it's a grave issue. You know it's not just, you know, a little white lie sort of thing. Then um, uh, you're not persevering in it. You are not making your election firm, your call and election firm, permanent. For in doing so, you will never stumble. So if we're vigilant in this, in, in our perseverance, in keeping this chain of the virtues together and developing it, strengthening that chain, then uh, we won't stumble. We may uh, totter a bit, but we won't stumble and fall. But of course, as, as First John tells us, if we do fall, we have uh, Jesus. We have we can repent. So it, uh, there are those who say, well, well if you, you've been forgiven once, and then you can, they can quote all sorts of Bible verses, uh, that's it. If you go back to that sin, there's no salvation for you. But that, that's not the Catholic interpretation of that. The Catholic interpretation is we can... Uh, you can get up as often as you fall and relying on grace. This does not uh, wink at presumption, say, well, you know, I'll get to that. So I'll, I'll enjoy my uh, grave sin while I'm at it. And I'll get to confession eventually or stuff like that. And I'll, you know, I'll, uh, you know, tell God I'm sorry, but not now. So that's, that won't work. For for in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. So if we persevere, if we, we don't have to worry. So we have, uh, we have the Lord there. So uh, it, it, this worry is such a torment to the scrupulous who think every little thing is a sin, that everything's a sin. If I enjoy it, it must be, it must be a sin. Now, you know, what you're enjoying might be sinful, I don't know. But everything isn't. And also, you know, the Lord is, we can often make the Lord into a, a false, wicked idol of who is uh, uh, not, not merciful at all. Or is selectively merciful. Well, I'll be merciful to you, but to you, I have no reason to be merciful to you. And I have no reason not to be merciful to you, and I just choose to do this because I'm powerful and I like to throw my weight around. That that uh, that idolatrous, uh, even blasphemous version of God. And there are plenty of Bible verses you can get and string together to build to build all sorts of idols of God as as wicked and out of out of control. Someone who has no sovereignty over himself. That God is love. And God is justice. And that may seem a paradox, but it's not. In fact, his justice is justifying. His justice can transform the sinner. But the sinner needs to be willing. The sinner has to cooperate. So that's one of the crucial differences between uh, Reformed Protestant theology and Catholic and Orthodox theology.
the soteriology there. Therefore, I will always remind you of these things. So that's what the teacher should be doing. So uh, uh, my friend Father Dharma, I because uh, often when I preach, I, I repeat a lot of stuff. Uh, it, I try to do it in different ways, of course, in different contexts and things, because uh, that. And I said, repetition is the mother of learning. But he said, but it's the sister of boredom. So, so that's why we have to, you know, in our teaching, put it in different ways, in different contexts, and different things. So, uh, but we're repeating the basic message. Therefore, I will always remind you of these things, even though you already know them and are established in the truth you have. I think it right as long as I am in this tent, this tent that's the, the, the image that St. Paul used, also St. Paul was a tent maker, about the body. Because the tent, you know, isn't necessarily that secure. A good blast of wind, no matter how you peg it down, you know, can take it off. I was just talking to someone about... Uh, uh, this thing I saw on uh, a me uh, on the internet of you know those bouncy castle things that they they inflated things they get often for children's parties <clears throat> these big big uh, inflated things well it was taken up by wind and just taken over went over these fences went a good while and then it just came out of the air the the way I envisioned the New Jerusalem coming down came down and landed in a tennis court or something, just perfectly, perfectly there. Uh, air delivery. And the, uh, we have to have our tent really pegged down. But uh, your mortal existence is always precarious. So you know, we can take this pandemic, for example. So I had a friend, yeah, he's my age, you know, up up there, uh, but he was in good shape. He was, uh, you know, he swam three times a week. He uh, uh, walked his 10,000 steps a day. Uh, he lifted weights. He uh, bicycles. He did all this uh, exercise. And he, for the most part, had a, a good diet, a healthful diet. And he was careful in, the, in this pandemic, but not everybody around him was. And he got it really bad and almost died. Luckily, he's just about completely recovered now. And uh, back to his swimming and bicycling and uh, get his 10,000 steps a day or more. So, uh, but uh, it just shows how precarious your existence is. You know, you, uh, you know, a couple days, you have, you know, get this in fact, you're dead. Could be. And imagine what it was like at the time of Peter. The time of Jesus, the time of Paul. Very precarious. Most people died before they were a year old, or at least uh, close to a majority, anyway, died before the year. And then a, a, another large bulk of the people died before they were, uh, they arrived at adolescence. And then people could die from anything. It was just very precarious. And they didn't know, they didn't have the germ theory, they didn't have all the medicines and medical practices that we have, and thank God for that. Thank the, uh, the scientists and the medical people who found these things and are applying that, especially now the heroism of so many uh, healthcare workers at this time during this pandemic. But it's very, your existence is, your, your material existence is very precarious. And St. Paul used that image. He said this tent, uh, and if you were talking about the, the mortal existence and how he was a tent maker and he, you know, knew how to make good quality leather tents and other sorts of things like that, that were made to last, unlike a lot of stuff made today, which is, has planned obsolescence. Uh, and uh, they, in those days, people expected things to last. And so as a, as a, a person who took that tent making seriously, he made good tents, but, but eventually the tent would fall apart. It, 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 would, it would decay, something would happen, fall apart, and that's the way it is with the body. No matter how you know you 
exercise, you watch your diet, you follow your doctor's advice and something. You know, eventually, you know, the the caretaker's gonna come and swing the keys and say, gentlemen, it's closing time. So there's me, this tent. As long as I am in this tent to stir you up by a reminder, as long as he's here in this in this life. Since now I know that I will soon have to put it aside, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. So, so uh, Peter was to be martyred, but he was getting up there. And so, you know, he knew that he would eventually be going from this life. I shall also make every effort to enable you always to remember these things after my departure. So that's one of the reasons of writing things down. <clears throat> for that, right? putting the oral tradition into writing, uh, which is what the scripture is, because it's not the whole of the oral tradition, it's a portion of the oral tradition, and it should always be in, in the context of the oral tradition, and interpreted uh, uh, authoritatively only by the church. So... If you have a doctrinal interpretation that's contrary to that of the church and your interpretation of the Bible, you're wrong. And uh, the, the say, well, no, I, I take this literally, and the church doesn't, or I don't take this literally, and the church does. Uh, something, you know, let's take the Eucharist, for example. But this is my body, this is my blood. My flesh is food indeed, my blood is meat indeed. So the historic church has always taken that literally. And not just the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Churches, <clears throat> not just the Chaldean Orthodox, but the Oriental Orthodox, the Assyrian Orthodox, all of the ancient churches. And uh, the Lutheran Church, also, this is believing in the real Christ, it's not in, in uh, using our definition of, the, of transubstantiation, but they believe in the real presence. And then some, it's temporary, it wears off, believe that, which the, that the Catholic Church rejects that. So the host in the tabernacle, Jesus is present there as when the priest says, this is my body. And so, but, you know, so while I, I, I reject that, so I'll go along with, quote, unquote, something more logical. Or you might say, oh, well, the Trinity, I reject that because this is how I interpret this. Or uh, the deity of Christ is, I want something more logical. And so I'll, uh, but it's because that's not logical. The logic of love, for fit these things fit perfectly into the logic of agape love and the omnipotence of god so you can go on on with that remember these things after my departure we did not follow cleverly devised myths so the uh the gnostics at this or the proto gnostics at this time that, uh, the gnosticism was this umbrella is an umbrella term for this intellectual and uh, mystical movement that, for the most part, uh, disparaged the material world. So uh, there's a big going beyond even you know, extremes of Platonism, I suppose, that uh, the material world is just a cage to trap us in. And so and we have to escape from that. And... <clears throat> The Gnostics say you do this by knowledge. No, sometimes it's just knowledge of uh, formulas and uh, incantations and stuff like that. Uh, secret knowledge, because they believed gnosis, that's one of the words for knowledge, along with epistemic, but uh, no, gnosis is, is this experiential knowledge. And uh, they say, we have it and you don't. We have the esoteric uh, teaching. And they would take uh, different religions and they would just reinterpret it and adapt it to their uh, philosophy of uh, escape and uh, reunion with the one, uh, ultimately. And uh, it had a great influence uh, on uh, the Manichae religion, and on it, which kept coming up in different manifestations, as in Catholicism and these other things. Uh, that uh, that was there, but uh, the proto-Gnostics may be people there. And often they had, St. Irenaeus points out 
that the the mythologies that they had, they had conflicting ones, but some of them would say, oh, these aren't really conflicting because these are myths. They are symbolic representations of truth. Uh, so the, the Sophia, the descent, the, the fall of Sophia, <coughs> all these different ones. And, and uh, different ones had different uh, eons, the sort of steps, uh, step beings up to the one, the ultimate. And... Um, uh, they had different, and, and, uh, and even gods. Uh, one form of Gnosticism had 365 gods, and they claimed to be Christian, but uh, one for every day. But uh, so, but this was an issue with these cleverly uh, made-up myths. And of course, he would be viewing this also the, as uh, a myth. He is here not in the positive sense of the word, but in in the uh, something made up our our view of it that's not conveying a truth but conveying an error in this thing. So uh, the, the Greco-Roman myths of the of the gods and, and the relations to the gods and all the stuff that they were doing, which were often not very edifying, and then of course there's you know the Egyptian the uh, the, the Semitic myths. They, you know, everybody had had their collection of myths, and but uh, Christianity maintains its historicity. So it's not about uh, once upon a time in a, a in a land far away, uh, in a, a long ago, or before time began as we know it. This was happening. Uh, no, it's. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate, a historical person, that God came in, not only into matter, which is bothersome enough to the, the Gnostics, but into history, fully into history. Not just gliding through, because some of the Gnostics said, well, he really can't, you know, Docetus, for example, uh, if you can, you know, uh, you don't have to necessarily be a Gnostic to be a Docetus. The Docetus said, uh, the incarnation, that's not only absurd, but blasphemous. How could God, or even a great spirit being, take on this full carnal reality or carnal illusion? Uh, that, you know, that he had to sweat, he had to go to the bathroom, he had to wash, he had to eat, he had to do all this stuff. And had to, he got tired, all this. How could the the ultimate do that? Or even, as I say, a powerful spirit being, they uh, would dismiss it. So it was all a play acting. It was all an illusion. It was all an appearance. From the Docetism comes from uh, the Greek word for it appears. So uh, that was a popular heresy. And St. Jerome said that it was uh, circulating before the, uh, almost as soon as the blood of Jesus was dried from the cross. Also coming with people who denied that Jesus was crucified, which you see in Islam and, and some of these other, other things, uh, other groups that would have that because it's, it wasn't fair. Well, of course, Christianity would say, of course it isn't fair. That's the whole purpose. God came to take on the unfairness of, of our uh, mortal life uh, on himself. And uh, the sin, all the sins done against others, and all the sins of the world take on himself <coughs> to be the Lamb of God, the uh, sacrifice, a symbol there. So these uh, cleverly devised myths, when we make known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he actually came into history. He is a, 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 a physical, material human being which is one of the reasons Orthodox Christianity uh, proclaim this by images, by paintings, all, all, statues and all that like. And we, uh, we suspect uh, those who denounce that as idolatry and other stuff, that they don't really get the full thing of what incarnation means, the taking flesh, taking on materiality. Because if you say you can't you know, make a, picture of Jesus, and it doesn't have to be you know, uh, 
an accurate representation of what he looked like. You could represent Jesus from every race and ethnicity and all that and any type of clothes and stuff. We do have the uh, uh, iconic uh, categorization, you know, the long hair, the uh, the oval face, the, the, the long, thin nose, stuff like that. Uh, wearing a, a white robe, usually, or something like that, a long robe, usually. You don't see him in uh, a business suit or something, or ordinarily like that. And a beard, of course, a beard, usually, and not a usually big, uh, fluffy beard, but it's like, that's, and uh, it's interesting, Buddha, Gautama Siddhartha Sakyamuni, they also uh, focused on a particular representation, iconic representation of him. So whenever you see this, you say, oh, that's Jesus. Where do you see that? You would say, well, that's the Buddha. Whether he looked like that or not, I don't know. Although I actually believe that the Shroud of Turin, most of the evidence there, the only thing that's not is the, it's the carbon-14 testing, which many think that the testing had been flawed uh, on that. And uh, they may even have taken a piece of cloth from another uh, that wasn't part of the original shroud or whatever, but because it was in a fire, all this, all this sweat on it, all this stuff. But anyway, I believe the shroud, but it's my belief. And I'm, I'm quite willing to have it completely disproved. It's not going to affect my faith anyway, uh, one way or the other. So, uh, He's fully human, went through our full human situation. He didn't just blow through or uh, sort of uh, uh, come on a slumming visit. No, he became fully human without ceasing to be fully God, but truly united as one person. And he was uh, miraculously conceived. In that and we don't see this as just some uh, made-up story to illustrate something because there are you know other, there are other virginal conceptions in uh, uh, in the uh, religious traditions of other religions and and, and uh, uh, you can find all this stuff so so people do that to try to uh, quote unquote disprove Christianity but we just know, though, this is historically, this is actually, this is, as C.S. Lewis said, the myth that's true. So, uh, the, uh, that he, you know, he actually died, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, which I thought when I was seven years old, or seven, six years old, I think, when we were learning it in the first grade, uh, in the Apostles' Creed, that he suffered under a bunch of violence. That's what I thought. Pontius Pilate, a, a person... Uh, that uh, we now have evidence, you know, from uh, uh, a, a seat plaque in, in Caesarea uh, Maritima that has found other things, uh, and not just uh, literary re uh, references, there's archaeological evidence for this person. He came at a particular time, through a particular, had a particular DNA, particularly came in particular circumstances, it was all that, uh, that it, and we do not say that these are just made up stories, that all that. That's actually the case. So um, the, resur the resurrection actually happened, a physical resurrection. The ascension actually happened. The second coming actually will happen. We made to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. His first coming, but also his second coming. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the unique declaration came to him from the majestic glory. This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So Peter was one of the witnesses of that at the transfiguration when Jesus is, is shines with the uncreated light of, of the energy of God and uh, he's there with two people, one of whom is definitely dead, uh, Moses, and Elijah, who is definitely out of the spatial temporal picture of, of this world. 
and he's conversing with them. They know what's going on and all this stuff. They're quietly conscious. So he converses with them, and Peter becomes the spokesman of the three men there, and he says, uh, "Let's uh, let's build some shrines for you here, and just just uh, bask in the glory of this." After being a fright, frightened by all this, didn't he get it? But no, they're to be sent back into all this. And the voice that comes, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. So, you know, Jesus fulfilling in his actions there, in his, his actions as prophet, his actions as Messiah, his actions as someone really fully incarnate. Uh, that's pleasing to the Father. He said, we ourselves heard this voice come from the heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain, with, with uh, Peter, Simon, was with the brothers James and John, the fishermen that he knew uh, from Galilee uh, before this happened, before you know, they got into the, into the Jesus movement there. Moreover, we possess, and traditionally that mountain is Mount Tabor in Galilee. We possess the prophetic message that is altogether reliable. So, so unlike the, the mysticism, the prophetic message is reliable. But of course it has to be interpreted, interpreted by the church and the power of the Holy Spirit in the context and the prophetic message isn't just the written, it's the oral also. Because at this point, it's almost all oral. Although Second Peter may actually have been the last book of the Bible that was composed. But, um, you know, it hasn't all been assembled and all this stuff yet uh, through the church. <coughs> and uh, canonized by the church. Since the prophetic message that is altogether reliable, so it's reliable. We can rely on that. We, by faith, we rely on this. So when we can test it, and the, we shouldn't be threatened by challenges to this, and that could give our answer. Says, you will do well to be attentive to it, as to a, shining, a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. This beautiful image, this dawn image. And the uh, so we... Uh, accept Holy Scripture as the inspired Word of God, as God-breathed. And we approach it in holy tradition uh, in the church, and we're not frightened by the tools of modern science in applying that, because uh, we know this is true. And uh, But we have to be careful of the uh, modernist heresy and stuff like that that's the, the enlightenment attitudes behind it, there are no miracles, stuff like that, that's often uh, sometimes behind some of the uses of this. No, Jesus actually is God, God the Word incarnate. He actually did have a virginal conception. He actually did rise bodily from the dead. He actually did ascend. He actually will come physically uh, at the, on the last day. So... So no, first of all, there is no prophecy of Scripture. It's a matter of personal interpretation. So it's not just the personal interpretation of the prophet, but it's not up to my personal interpretation in the area of doctrine. So I can't say contradicting uh, the apostolic tradition in the church and say, no, uh, this, uh, this doctrine, uh, you interpret this verse to uh, teach this doctrine, I say no. I say that your doctrine is false and that uh, uh, we're not going to interpret it this way. Uh, the example I used was the real presence, you know, that throwing that out. Baptism of regeneration, another one could we, we had talked about earlier in First Peter. Um, that's another one. So they say, no, no, this is this and this is that. and uh, They go away from that. So there's no prophecy of scripture that's a matter of personal interpretation. For no prophecy ever came through human will, but rather human beings moved by the Holy Spirit spoke under the influence of God. Oops. This is my 
I've shut it before and marked where I left off. There. So let's look at the Ignatius, the Ignatius Study Bible commentary for Second Peter here. Participation in divine life comes through the sacraments because it's talking about the uh, partaking of the divine nature, in especially in baptism there. So, cleanse from sin. This is verse nine. Experience first in baptism, Acts twenty two sixteen. Then, in an ongoing way, by confessing our faults and seeking the Lord's mercy, Matthew 6, 12, 1 John 1, 9. The point here is that forgiveness obliges us to mend our ways and to make progress in holiness. Your call and election, verse 10. Believers are chosen and called by God to be his own people in Christ. The status is maintained and confirmed by living the faith and attaining the virtues of gospel morality outlined in 2 Peter 1, 5-7. It is jeopardized, however, if one becomes re-entangled in a life of sin. The danger that one might fall shows that confirming one's election is a matter of real and crucial importance. That is, it cannot be reduced to a merely subjective or personal reassurance that one's salvation has already been eternally secured. So it's eternally willed, but it has to be temporally secured. We have to persevere. When we're dead and we persevered in grace, then we will know eternal security. In verse 11, the eternal kingdom, union with God in heaven, is the kingdom of God in its fullness and perfection. So we're beginning, we're citizens of heaven, we're beginning to live in it, we have the foretaste, but the fullness is that unobstructed union with God, which the state of heaven is. So uh, Peter wants readers to remember that he taught them, after, to, and to remember this after his death. This focus on the future leads some scholars to claim that 2 Peter exhibits characteristics of a testament, a popular literary form in Judaism, which, in which great figures of biblical history bequeath to posterity, to austerity, a series of prophecies and ethical instructions on their deathbed. So you see you know, the, the, tes the uh, testament of the 12 patriarchs, or these various uh, pseudepigraphal works that uh, Claim to be written by these people and weren't, but uh, which doesn't mean that it's a, a text, if it's claimed to be this, isn't inspired or isn't of the school of someone like, let's say, Deuter or Isaiah, for example. But uh, these these aren't these aren't uh, uh, scriptural, but they're very interesting. This body, verse thirteen, literally this tent, an image that signifies the temporary duration of our bodily life on earth, wisdom 9, 15, Isaiah 38, 12. For the saints, these tents are folded away at death and give way to a permanent dwelling in a resurrected body. See the note on 2 Corinthians 5, 1, which we talked about uh, just a few minutes ago. Christ showed me, verse 14, Christ warned Peter that he would die a martyr in his old age. John 21, 18, it says, you know, you'll be... Your hands will be tied and you'll be led where you don't want to go. Now that Peter is an elderly man writing in his early to or mid-60s, so I'm beyond my mid-60s, but okay, he knows that the end of his life is drawing near, something that Peter is referring to a personal revelation from Christ that is not recorded in the New Testament, but concerns the timing of his death my departure, or my exodus, so exodus is out of the way, or way out. 
So the, the death is an exodus from the grief of this life. Eyewitnesses. The Apostle Peter, James, and John accompanied Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration. Their testimony to Christ was therefore based on the facts of history and first-hand experience. Quite unlike the imaginary tales spun by false teachers denounced by St. Peter there. The past revelation of Christ's glory is considered a preview of the future revelation of Christ's glory at his second coming. See the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraphs 5, 54, and 55. As 19, 18 is the Holy Mountain Mount Tabor there. Uh, 19, the day dawns, the eschatological, that's about the end, the end of time, the end of everything, uh, temporal temporary, the eschatological day of the Lord, the day of judgment. For its meaning, the morning star, ancient writers used this expression for the planet Venus, which is sometimes visible in the morning sky just before daybreak. In addition, the expression is probably an allusion to Numbers 2417, where the star that rises out of Jacob is seen in Jewish and Christian tradition as a prophetic image of the Messiah as in Revelation 22, 16. Peter connects this with the return of Christ in glory, an event that will dawn upon the world at the end of history and bring joy to the heart of every believer who is eagerly awaiting him. Hebrews 9, 28, verse 20. One's own interpretation. The spirit who inspired the prophecies of the Old Testament is alone capable of interpreting them. And that's worth repeating. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who inspired the prophecies of the Old Testament, is alone capable of interpreting them. By contrast, merely human intelligence can never ascertain their proper meaning without the divine assistance of the Spirit. The ramifications of this teaching are implied rather than stated. For Peter does not identify those who are authorized to give a correct interpretation of Scripture. That is the Church. Some contend that every believer who possesses the Spirit is automatically qualified for the task. But no such teaching can be found in the New Testament. Also, experience goes against that. Because prayerful, godly people who sincerely approach the Scriptures come up with completely contradictory interpretations. So... Uh, they could all be wrong, or one could be right, but how do you know? You know, I claim, I have the Holy Spirit. No, I have the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit. Uh, oh, we all have the Holy Spirit. But if we all have the Holy Spirit, uh, and we're the ones who are supposed to interpret it, why do we all have the, a different interpretation of something important? This is, you know, about, you know, should we chew uh, gum or not or something. So these are crucial things. Of us, of things uh, about salvation, about the sacraments, about uh, Christian life. On the contrary, we learn from other passages that the Spirit guides the Church into all truth through her apostolic leaders and their successors, who serve as teachers and guardians of the Christian faith. 1 Timothy 6.20, 2 Timothy 1.14, and Two, two. This explains why Peter, being an apostle, expects readers to accept his teaching on Scripture as authoritative and reliable. He's also the first pope, whereas the false teachers among them are denounced for twisting its meaning. Verse 21, by the Holy Spirit. A description of prophetic inspiration, whereby God uses the prophet to speak his divine message to others. Peter's stress on this point may suggest that the false teachers disputed such inspiration, or at least made interpretive claims at variance with it. History knows of heretical Jewish Christians called the Ebionites, who claim that the biblical prophets spoke of their own accord, apart from divine assistance or influence. They also deny the deity of Christ, and also that you had to be Jewish in a if you were going to be a member of the church. You had to observe the Jewish customs. Um, you had to convert to Judaism, in other words. 
For the related mystery of biblical inspiration, we or see Second Timothy three sixteen, which we'll get to uh, later, later, not today, but we will again look at the fathers of the church on this. That we're not to forget that we were cleansed from our old sins and we have to stay away from that. They emphasize that. Ecumenius. This person ought to realize that he has been cleansed by holy baptism and now he is expected to pursue holiness. So it's not just a, oh, I have it made, I got baptized. Oh, I have it made, I got saved somewhere along the line. And uh, that's that. So I don't have to grow in the spirit. I don't have to grow in virtue. I don't have to pursue holiness. Indeed, we should let holiness pursue us. And we should act on that. And confirming your call an election. So they, uh, the fathers say you have to grow in faith there. You have to stand fast. Andreas, lest you be judged unmindful of God's gift, you must stand fast, that is, persevere having a sure calling. Make your calling certain, be venerable. Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. The calling of all who have come to faith is certain, but those who consistently add good works to the sacraments of faith, which they have received, are the ones who make their calling and election certain in the eyes of those who observe them. The opposite is also true. For those who go back to their crimes after they have been called and who die in their sins, make it clear to everyone that they are damned. So practice virtue to avoid falling. So uh, we'll go on. So we'll go on to, ver uh, to chapter two uh, next time. Evil people and their fate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, get up. Oh, let's, and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And let's pray the Our Father, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let's see who's waving. Timothy Mills out there in California by the monastery. Gwen Davis Von Feld, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Linda Bracha Kefai, ragazza. Uh, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Father Robert Hart, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Father Paul Ring, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. So let's continue to pray for each other. For Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be.